You never know what one talk, one line, one relationship might spark into action and how the world might be different because you got just a little bit stronger in your leadership. Recognize you don't have to know it all, you don't have to be perfect, but you've been chosen for this moment. Step into it. Don't obsess about things that don't matter. Get mo good enough to move on. The role of leaders is not to be the hero of anyone else's story, but rather to do the hard work in ourselves so that we can inspire and equip others to be the hero of theirs. Turn the negotiation into a collaboration. Connect. You'll be shocked at how far you will get when you connect with people. There's no shortcut to your goals that avoids failure. It doesn't exist. So we've got to embrace those failures. Don't run from them. And your team should be drinking from the overflow of the inspiration in your life. But if you're not making it a discipline to fill your well, you're gonna have nothing left for your team. What are you doing to fill your well? You owe it to your team to be a model of what prolific, brilliant, and healthy looks like. The opportunities and the obstacles facing our world today are crying out for healthy leaders we need your influence. We need your impact shape in the world. We need you to level up your leadership. The time is now. Why not practice it being rejected? I'm gonna add more opportunities for rejection to my life. I'm gonna start asking him some open-ended questions. I wanna act in my calling of being a table setting leader. I need to live to my higher calling and, and step into it. I've already signed up for my staff to do the 30-day challenge on uh, how to overcome our fear of rejection. I'm going to use the mirroring technique to, to connect. Be more intentional with people on a daily basis. Do what we're called to do in the small ways and in the big ways. Hello, my name is Dan Tarrant, and I'm the founder of Reengaged Ministries, which produces the video series and TV show Personally Catholic. I am so excited to invite you this year to join Personally Catholic as we attend the Global Leadership Summit. The Global Leadership Summit has literally changed my life, where I should say that God has used the Global Leadership Summit to change my life. There are countless times at the Global Leadership Summit where God has spoken into my life and not only shown me what He wanted me to do next, but also how to do it. Um, the Global Leadership Summit is a place where you can sit and listen to the voice of God and where you can get actionable tools and tips and assistance in actually pursuing what the voice of God is calling you to do. At the Global Leadership Summit, you're going to be surrounded by people who are different. And that's what the word holy literally means. It means being different. It means being set apart. If you want to be different for Jesus Christ, if you want to serve Jesus Christ as somebody who is holy or different from the world around you, and if you want to be different in the way that you live and you want to change in your life, then you have to be surrounded by other Christians who are different. At the Global Leadership Summit, there have been Catholic speakers, there have been Protestant speakers, there has even been a Coptic sister, a Coptic nun who spoke, uh, Maggie Gobran. You're going to be exposed to leadership from countless Christian communities and it's gonna change your leadership in your Catholic community. Through the Global Leadership Summit, I have been given hope. Hope that God has a purpose for me in the midst of my role in the Catholic Church. And I have to be honest, through the Global Leadership Summit, I haven't become less Catholic. Frankly, I've become more Catholic. And I haven't become less committed to serving in the Catholic Church. I've become more committed to serving in the Catholic Church. Do what leaders do. Leaders change the world. So I'm excited today to share some of my friends with you. Uh, and I just think that God is going to bless this time. And if you find yourself blessed at this time, 
you're going to be blessed at the Global Leadership Summit. Uh, Father Lorig, when did you first uh, start to make a decision for Jesus Christ, and how did you come into this whole thing, which has obviously led you to the Catholic priesthood? Yeah, thanks, Dan. And first of all, it's just really good to be with some some other Catholics that are, that have discovered the summit and love it, and that's uh, because I kind of felt alone in that, so it's just good to kind of <laughs> start to discover the, uh, other people who are really into this. Um, so I would say uh, when I was a young man, I was uh, 11 years old, and my mom passed away from cancer, and I have a really strong memory of uh, having a personal conversation with God the night before she died. And uh, so just really personal, just really, I, I knew God was real in, in that moment. That's so, sort of when the, the walk began. But then uh, I would say two years into my priesthood is when I really gave my life to Jesus. Certainly, I, when I was ordained, I laid on an altar or on a marble floor, and, and I submitted my life to Jesus and, and his church. But uh, I don't know if my heart was really converted until about two years into the priesthood. And uh, I was about ready to leave, kind of had a rough first two years, had some struggles, some issues from my past, and, uh, and it kind of caught up with me amidst of all the stress. And um, somebody taught me how to pray, finally. I was, I was like discerning my way out, like, hey, I got to get out of this thing. And so, but I wanted to do it right. So I, I, I asked somebody to help me, a spiritual director and from, from the Institute for Priestly Formation. And he, uh, he said, well, all right, we can do that, but you need to learn how to pray first. So uh, I began to really learn how to pray in, in a contemplative way and just to spend time with Jesus, just me looking at him and him looking at me. Uh, and, uh, and I kind of fell in love with him because I, I knew he was in love with me. And so I can't get that gaze out of my, my heart. And so I just want to keep, keep being his. That's, that's my story. Amen. Amen. And I, I think that's, well, that's all of our story. And uh, again, it's a testimony to the fact that we have to keep saying yes to Jesus. Uh, the moment we stagnate and think that we've finished the race, we're just deceiving ourselves. If, if we're still here, God still must have work to do in us. <laughs> and you can't do that work for him unless you allow him to do that work in you. And uh, I know that journey so very well. Um, yeah. So, Father, thank you for your witness. Uh, Joe <laughs> works um, in a Catholic parish, St. Thomas More, uh, out in Colorado. And uh, Joe, tell us how you came to know Jesus and, and uh, encounter that personal relationship with him. Oh, because my story um, is definitely a little messier than everyone else's. I was baptized Catholic. I experienced my first Eucharist. I should say celebrated that. And then about a year later, my parents stopped attending church. Um, they didn't influence us any further in the Catholic faith. I didn't feel like I had really good role models in that. And, and in the same respect, my family was very um, broken. And there was a lot of uh, abuse and neglect and some strains that I was experiencing in my life. And so, as you can imagine, as a teenager, you just kind of want to run away and kind of get away from all of it. And uh, I found my husband, got married, never dealt with any of the baggage that I came into the relationship with. And um, after the birth of my second child, I experienced postpartum depression really bad. Um, in fact, to the brink of, of suicide inclination. And um, life just felt like it wasn't worth living anymore. And out of desperation, one evening, I remember before I went to sleep, I just I cried out to Jesus. And I said, you know, if you're there and you really exist, um, you know, help me. I, tell me what I need to do. Tell me what my purpose is. Um, tell me um, that you exist and that you love me. Otherwise, this just isn't worth living anymore. I, I'm done. And I fell asleep crying. And that evening in the middle of the night, uh, I got woken up, a little tap on the shoulder. And Jesus had an incredible encounter with me and gave me some instruction about what he wanted to do. And um, And obviously, I'm a stubborn person. I think Wesley knows that a little bit. Um, you know, Dan, you're coming to maybe know that a little. Tom, uh, you know, and that stubborn personality was definitely fiery then. And so my mission at that point, when anybody has an experience with Jesus and he's talking to them, you know, maybe it's, oh, my goodness, I, I just talked to Jesus and he gave me the word. And, you know, now he gave me some mission for my life. And I was like, OK, so you think you're right. Well, I'm going to prove you wrong. And so. My next step was, I'm going to prove you wrong. Everything that you told me that I need to do, what my purpose was. And, um, and he knew that that would happen, of course. And it was kind of like kneading the dough, I guess, in a good uh, dough that's being baked. Um, if anyone does that from home, they understand it takes a lot of tender care. And, and Jesus definitely was doing that in my heart. And 
um, just continuously walked with me and and led me where I needed to be um, back in full communion with the Catholic Church. And now, you know, I'm leading ministry at a Catholic Church. I've been on staff for over 10 years and I started a company about eight years ago uh, for evangelization called Raised in Faith. So God bless, you know, God and in my life and the way that he's been able to um, provide mercy in his love. Joe, that's so awesome. You know, I used to do uh, a lot of youth ministry. I'll never forget being on this retreat, and we had a number of kids uh, who were struggling with suicide, and I knew that, and I'm giving this uh, message towards the end of the retreat. Um, and they were just, it was a burden on my heart just to speak to them. And I said, look, if you're thinking about giving up your life and committing suicide, how about before that, you just give your life to God? I mean, if you're going to throw it away anyway, you might as well give God a chance. Because, uh, you know, if he's out there, you just might meet him if you throw it away physically. And, um, right. and, you know, I know for a number of the kids, that was a turning point moment for them. And we invited them to make a decision about Jesus Christ. And all of our woundedness is leading us to Jesus Christ, to meet him on the cross where he was wounded for us. I mean, we think that we have to run from our pain and hide our pain to be able to serve Jesus Christ. And as so many summit leaders have said, like Patrick Lencioni has said, really, Real leadership begins with vulnerability, and vulnerability to yourself, and vulnerability to God, and then, and then vulnerability to your peers. Uh, Joe, you have just a beautiful witness, and uh, I cannot wait <laughs> Thank to you. hear how your journey continues to unfold in your beautiful ministry. Um, so I'm excited to share with our audience um, just a little bit more about the Global Leadership Summit and uh, what that experience was like. I'm gonna tell you about my first experience at the Global Leadership Summit. I was on staff at a Catholic parish, uh, this is back in 2002, and uh, I came on staff to help lead young adult ministry and adult faith formation, and, um, and it was beautiful. I was basically hired to be an evangelist, and I thought, well, I know Jesus, I know the church, and I know how to give a good talk. We're good. I don't need any other advice. <laughs> and um, I'll never forget Father Jim LeGuin was our pastor, and he said, Dan, our whole staff is going to this event called the Global Leadership Summit. Uh, you're going to have to be there at 9 a.m. at this other church, an hour away, and um, it's just part of your job. And I'm like, oh, man, why am I working for a parish? Now i got a pastor telling me i got to go to these conferences. I've never heard of a good conference. And so, and I will never forget, it was the conference where um, the founder of Yahoo spoke, uh, and where Pat Summit spoke. And the founder of Yahoo talked about leading out of abundance. He said, that there are people who lead and they think, well, God needs you to take something from someone else so that you can succeed. And he said, no, God needs you to take his gift, to take from his abundance instead of take from someone else. And that whole summit, it just blew my mind. Um, I had actually agreed to only work at this church part-time um, because I was afraid of uh, working at a parish. I thought, well, what good can you do for a church uh, working at a parish? And I left that summit saying, man, I wish I took this job full-time. How could I not want to give my life not only to Jesus Christ, but to serving the Catholic Church? Uh, if churches can be like this, if a local church could be like this, I'm all in. And uh, it just changed my um, expectations for what good leadership could be. So that was my first experience at the summit. And then uh, ever since then, uh, the summit was just irresistible. And I found myself saying a deeper yes to God and his call in my life to lead uh, because of my annual experiences at the summit. Uh, Tom, would you tell us a little bit about your experience at the summit and what got you there? Yeah, I would love to do that, Dan. And it was just, uh, just want you to know how encouraging it was to me to hear your story. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, our, that's one of our prayers at the summit is how people can say that deeper yes to God and how the Holy Spirit meets uh, men and women in the summit experience in ways that are so transformational, and it's almost it, mystical, and we can't explain it, and we know how that happens. For me, it happened uh, at the second summit, uh, which was back in 1996, and I'd had uh, a real good pastoral friend uh, who was a pastor in Southern California go to the first summit and came back and said, uh, this experience was so powerful for me personally, you have to go next year. And so I'm like, I've never really heard about this. How does that happen? Uh, I planted a church about 60 miles east of LA and 
Uh, I took our small staff and our spouses, and we went to the Global Leadership Summit at that point in time, and it was profound. It was, uh, I think for me, often as a leader, there's a certain loneliness in that, and there's a challenge in that. Uh, Sometimes you feel like you're the only person uh, who really gets what you're trying to do, and it takes all of your effort. And one of the things we found with the summit is that uh, 10% of the people that go to the summit every year uh, are ready to throw in the towel and give up. And because of that summit experience, uh, they're ready to continue and kind of re-up for what God might have for them uh, and for their leadership. And I can remember that first summit being that inspiration and encouragement uh, and transformation for me. Uh, I was kind of like your experience to say, okay, where can I sign? Where can that deeper yes uh, for me go as uh, as a pastor, uh, as a leader, uh, as someone who's wanting to make a difference in our world? And uh, I look back um, and, and can almost look at the seat that I was in in that first summit uh, and the profound difference that it made in my leadership uh, and also made in my life and calling. You know, it's funny. I mean, God just changes everything. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And he sees things differently. Uh, but, and when you meet him and you have an experience where you see things differently because of him infusing his spirit in your life, like, that's just, it's just a, it's just a special moment. It's a moment you want to remember for the rest of your life. And uh, I feel like there are countless times I could say I was sitting in that seat at the summit and God spoke into my life, um, just as he did in so many other, just like in Eucharistic adoration, I could speak to that, in my own house, in my prayer chair, uh, but he's also spoken to me in the summit. Um, in confession today, God spoke to me, but it's the same God who speaks to me at the summit, and um, yeah, it's just a blessing for me as a Catholic to be there uh, with all of you guys, so thank you for saying yes to the summit and to God. Uh, Wesley, tell me a little bit about your relationship uh, with the summit. When did you first go to a summit, and what was that first experience like for you? So really in the early 2000s, um, we had helped to uh, plant a second campus of a church in you know, my mid-20s, and I didn't know anything about doing that. All I knew is the leadership demands were increasing. Uh, people were not doing what I wanted them to do. Uh, you know, I, I know that I'm the only one that experienced that. And I remember driving about three, three and a half hours to a different city uh, to attend this thing called uh, the Leadership Summit at that time. And uh, just remember being profoundly impacted by uh, just the entirety of the experience. And it wasn't too much longer after that uh, that my senior pastor walked through uh, our office door and said, hey, I agreed to host this thing called the Global Leadership Summit. Figure it out. And I said, hey, you're not supposed to do that without talking to me first. I was serving as executive pastor and responsible for implementation and and all of those details. And it was the best decision we ever made is to become a host site for the Global Leadership Summit to serve our city. Uh, And our city has grown now to where we have five public host sites and we have some private gatherings uh, across our city as well. And it's just been a a real joy to see uh, that opportunity expand to create this opportunity for people to come together across these lines that tend to divide us. And a lot of those lines are silly lines. Uh, You're a different flavor of of Protestant, or maybe you're, uh, God forbid, a part of the Catholic Church, and we can't interact (laughs) at all because we don't know why, we just can't. And those barriers begin to break down, and people enter into this space, uh, and really they create space for God to show up. And I don't know about you, Dan, but uh, any time I've ever created space for God, he always has shown up. And that's what happens every year at the summit. And as a byproduct, our leadership began to get better. We began to learn new things. Our, our thoughts were stretched in ways that we had never considered before. And it directly helped us uh, in our leadership, not only as a pastoral staff and the responsibility from a even a vocational call and that sort of thing, but also the responsibility we have that Ephesians points out to invest in and empower uh, the saints for the work of ministry. Uh, And so to see people uh, who are everyday common people take on the leadership mantle and uh, fulfill the calling that God has on their life is just absolutely incredible for us. So it is, as Tom mentioned, really all about the transformation. Yeah, yeah, and I think that you know, the word holy means different. 
It means set apart, right? Uh, well, if you want to let God make you holy or different, it helps to expose yourself to God's people who are different than you. Uh, I, I love the Catholic Church. I love the sacraments. I am Catholic through and through. And I love my evangelical brothers and sisters in Christ. And without them, I would be less of a leader. And so one of the special features about the summit is the ecumenical nature of it, that it is Christian leaders from all these different churches just sharing their story. It's not a time to debate theology or argue Christian beliefs. In fact, some of the leaders are, some of the speakers are even non-Christians. Because of the summit, the belief is that we can learn from anybody, that God can speak to us through anybody if we're open. Um, and so I have found in my life, if I really want to grow in my holiness or my differentness, I have to be willing to be around Catholics and non-Catholic Christians who are different. And that's what the summit has provided for me. And it's, I have countless friendships um, with countless Protestant leaders that have blessed me. And I'm more Catholic than ever, uh, but I'm a better Catholic leader for it. Well, and Dan, one of the things that we do at the summit uh, is we hold on to that value that armed with enough humility, you can learn from people that are radically different from you. Mm -hmm. And so calling people to a point of mutual respect honors their journey. Yeah. Uh, some people have a strong faith journey, and then some people who participate in the summit have no faith journey at all yet. And so it is exciting to see our lives intersect in that manner. Hey, Father Jeff, tell us a little bit, bit for you, um, your first experience at the summit. What got you there, and then what, what impact did that have on you? Yeah, I, I uh, think I heard about it in a reading book, and just heard that another priest went to it, a, a, priest, I, a priest I really admire. And, uh, um, and then so I kind of tucked that in the back of my brain, and then I met somebody who uh, was at a church, a Methodist church in Kansas City, and uh, I was just talking to her, and she said, oh, we host the Global Leadership Summit. I'm like, oh, I'd love to go to that. I didn't know what I was talking about. I just like, oh, I'm just trying to make a conversation. <laughs> and so uh, next thing I know, she's inviting us with uh, free complimentary ticket tickets, and she's like, you know, come stay at our house. So I, I'm like, oh, why not? You know, I'm always looking to grow in my leadership, and, and I, I might maybe have the same of the problems as, as Wesley, where I say something and nobody does it. Uh, so... <laughs> They always say, you know, if, you know if, if you're a leader and nobody's following you, you're just going for a walk. Uh, so I, I, I hold that dear to my heart. Like, so I, part of being a leader, part of being a shepherd uh, as a pastor is being able to take people from one place to another. And if, if there's a way I can do that better, uh, then, then I want to learn that. So another priest friend and I uh, from here in Omaha where I'm at and uh, somebody from our chancery. Actually, I was working at the chancery at the time as well. I said, let's go down to Kansas City and check this summit out. Uh, there was a good list of speakers uh, and, you know, like John Maxwell, you know, some of these great leadership speakers. I thought, why not? It's not going to cost anything. It's, it'll be fun. Uh, so we went down to this uh, Church of Resurrection in Kansas City, and uh, we really wanted to not only see the summit, but we wanted to see this church that was one of the largest and fastest growing churches, Methodist churches in the United States. Like, oh, well, you know, what's going on there? Um, so we got to experience amazing hospitality, amazing technology. Uh, just a great welcome and we even stayed at the at the lady's house uh and uh just between uh, uh the catholics here on this uh, uh father my priest friend celebrated mass in his room so wow. <laughs> in the room where we were staying but uh, uh so uh, we blessed it in a way but it was just uh so i went to it and i was blown away after the first talk uh craig rochelle uh who's a, a pastor down in, in oklahoma I'd never heard him before I, I i live in my little catholic bubble and yeah. uh so i i didn't i'd never really experienced this power and this leadership, you know, I read a lot of Catholic books and I just don't see a lot about Catholic leadership. Exactly. And, and I, I honestly think one of the, beyond the, the many crises we have in the church, uh, one might be evangelization. Mm. Uh, we kind of forgot, forgotten what we're supposed to be doing, what we're about. But then I think the other crisis is leadership. And when I went down there, it happened to be in the midst of the, uh, Theodore McCarrick, right? Cardinal McCarrick stuff. And, and you're just like, you're wanting your bishops to be leaders and you want, you want things to, you, you want to be led. And, and I, I think maybe as, as a younger priest, I was feeling like maybe we weren't being led all that well by our bishops. I love my bishop and I, and I, love, and I respect the office for sure. Um, but I just thought, man, we could learn a lot uh, by, by growing in our leadership and being transparent and, and making tough decisions. Uh, and I think, I think many Catholics today would, would agree with me that maybe we've had a 
an absence of a vacuum of leadership. Um, again, not bad people, just maybe we've never really emphasized that. So after that first talk, I think I heard Craig Rochelle say something like, uh, you know, if you give people in, in your in your team tasks to do, you create followers. But if you give them authority, if you give them responsibility, you create new leaders. And that just hit home with me because I, I, I working at the Chancery and I was had all these direct reports. I'm just a priest from Omaha. Like I don't I don't know what a direct report is. Uh, I don't know what, a, what how to manage people. But I just know that I was struggling being a leader uh, in my organization with my staff. And when he said that, it just rang a, a, a very loud bell in my in my heart that said, wow, there's just a better way to do this. Uh, and so as I got converted after the first talk. I turned to Father Dan, my friend who was with me, and I said, we're going to do this in Omaha. So we, we ended up uh, hosting it. At, at, uh, we found a big old spot at Creighton University. Uh, they gave us a nice discount so we could host it there with big screens and all that. And we had over 300 Catholics uh, participate uh, that uh, last summer. And uh, so this year, our goal was to get it into a parish and begin to create new leaders, new uh, new people who, who were excited about it and wanted to lead it in their own parish because it really is a local church event. It can be a very powerful event for, for a local church. Uh, so that's where we're at uh, right now. And it's, and it's it's taken off. I mean, I think we're going to we're going to have a, a great crowd. Uh, this, even even amidst the, the COVID stuff, I think we're going to have a lot of Catholics participating. God wants to change the world. God wants his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that all the time in the Lord's Prayer. Well, do you want to know how God wants to change the world? God wants to change the world through you. Now, you might think that you're somebody who doesn't have influence. You might think that you're somebody who's not a leader. But the reality is, is that all of us have influence over somebody. All of us influence other people's thoughts, beliefs, opinions, and actions. All of us are leaders. And we're either leading well or we're leading poorly. We're either leading for God or we're leading against God. How about you? At the Global Leadership Summit, God has made it clear that I am a leader and that I have to take that position of authority seriously. I'm a leader in my house, as a father and a husband. I'm a leader in my neighborhood. I'm a leader on sports teams that I coach. And as a servant of the church, I'm a leader in the Catholic Church. Where do I go to grow in my leadership capacity? Where do I go to grow as a Catholic leader? For me, I go to the Eucharist. I go to confession. I go to other Catholic leaders who can speak into my life. And I also go to the Global Leadership Summit every year. The Global Leadership Summit has been a place where God has consistently spoken into my life. God consistently speaks into my life every week at the Eucharist. He also consistently speaks into my life every week at confession. And he speaks into my life consistently through the Catholic friends I have who sharpen me just by their Catholic witness. And finally, he sharpens my Catholic focus and speaks into my life at the Global Leadership Summit. I encourage you as a Catholic this year to consider attending the Global Leadership Summit with us at Personally Catholic. Go to personallycatholic.com to learn how to experience the Global Leadership Summit with us. We have to ask ourselves, are we leading for the right reason? We're called to see potential in people when others only see problems. We're called to see hope when others only see chaos. If you have a strong voice, jump in there, not only for yourself, but to advocate for the next person. Every generation can lead, am I right? If you want to change things, you've got to change the right things. Disruption is not a threat, it's an invitation. Don't be afraid to go places no other leader has been. The role of leaders is to do the hard work in ourselves so that we can inspire and equip others to be the hero of theirs. Do what leaders do. Leaders change the world.